Beth, my first question for you is a kind of an easy one and a difficult one at the same time. I've had professors, politicians, pop stars on here explaining to me what K-pop is, what K-dramas are. Can you explain to us what Korean literature is, please? So this question took me a while to really think about. Um, for me, in the simplest terms, Korean literature is literature produced by people of Korean descent. So mostly in the Korean language. Hmm. And I mean, if you want to get ancient, you could say in classical Chinese. But um, I would say that for me, I just want to disclaim that I'm not an expert on Korean literature by training, but hmm. I am an avid reader and translator of modern Korean literature. Hmm. So for me, when I speak of Korean literature, I'm referring to that mostly. And modern, I would say, is literature written starting from the early 20th century. So coinciding with the start of the Japanese colonial period, so around 1910, mm. or, you know, give or take a few years. And um, obviously there are subcategories of Korean uh, literature, like diaspora literature, which is um, literature written by, you know, Korean people of Korean descent, but in English, Spanish, German, French, you know, wherever there are diaspora populations mm. and, you know, various subgenres, science fiction, um, I don't know if you can call webtoons a, a subgenre, but um, mm. yeah. So I think that would be broadly speaking how I would define Korean literature. Is it, you mentioned that modern literature starts maybe the 20th century, the Japanese coloni colonization time. Does that produce, does, is that significant in any way? Because sometimes in Korea, I found there's a lot of like that 1910, 1945 didn't really happen and things there is not Korean things, you know. It's a very difficult conversation. I try to remain respectful. Korean literature started during that time. Do you have any observations about it starting during colonization time? Um, so I think that uh, modern, based on my, just my research, mm. um, modern Korean literature, um, happens to coincide with that time, I think, because of the um, Japanese colonial government enforcing Japanese mm -hmm. on the native Korean population. And so you see um, a more, uh, I would say, robust production of literature in the, you know, indigenous Korean language, because there is a sense of threat, right, mm -hmm. in the mm -hmm. social context and political context. And so I can't give you any very specific scholarly answers about mm, this, but mm -hmm. I would say that um, it really started to, the, the colonial period itself really kicked off this um, sort of self-identity, self-searching um, uh, movement as well in the Korean culture, because yeah, like if your um, language and your culture are under threat, it's natural to start producing um, cultural artifacts and cultural um, products that mm. express and preserve what you know what you had to already taken for granted which is we're Korean this is a Korean language but now it's under threat mm. yeah. yeah that makes perfect sense this is perhaps a, a very broad question but I wonder I'm just trying to think out loud whether you know good writing takes place during extreme conditions and we'll come to sort of you know mm. korean writing in the 60s and 70s but i'm wondering like you know to produce literature you need you need a history and you need things to draw on you need these sources so you know korea has a very turbulent 19th 20th century there's a lot of history going on here isn't there so i wonder mm -hmm. if that kind of fuels or give rise to Korean literature. It draws people to the page to start writing stuff down. Right. Um, I think that you can see that there's a lot of the literature or, yeah, a lot of these like periods in Korean literature are um, basically set off or sparked by major changes politically and economically and socially. Mm. And I think the Japanese colonial period is one of those big, markers if you wanted to categorize it broadly and then there's also modernization so starting from the mid-1960s when the uh you know korean government started to push for a big economic um industrialization of mm. and modernization of the country and then um recently i would even argue that the the Hallyu, the korean government's uh pushing of soft culture was also another um kind of starting, uh, I guess, point of 
um, development or kicking off a new era of Korean literature, mm. which we can get into later. So, yeah, I think those are broadly speaking, I, I observe those to be the major markers. But, mm. um, you know, obviously, <laughs> other people who are more like scholarly, they can give you more detailed uh, facts about that. But that's how I see it. Yeah. When you talk about the Hallyu thing, so we, we will go into it in more detail, but I asked you what Korean literature is. Is Korean literature K-literature? Are they different? Because sometimes I get this idea that Korean dramas are sometimes very kind of like saguk things and they're very popular domestically, whether it was that Red Sleeve one or Ibang one. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but the K dramas are kind of different. They're the ones designed for export. Is there a difference between Korean literature and K literature, or are they just two words for the same thing? Um, so right now, I would say that K literature as like a catch, sort of a catchy term, yeah. is quite recent. Um, okay. Uh, so in my view, because the market is so nascent, I think so. For, just to get a baseline Korean literature has always been there right like anywhere you have a culture you have literature mm. but um I do I do observe that there's been a more concerted push from the government to make it an exportable product mm. um so for example okay k-book trends is actually a web magazine published by the publication industry promotion agency of Korea and um this is a website that's very very slick and you can see it's really um just perfectly packaged for overseas um, industry, uh, like book publishers, mm. um, readers, like marketing companies. And it was really, uh, and actually the Korean publication culture industry itself was, uh, promotion agency itself was established in July, 2012 um, because of a government act. Like the government actually you know, cons made a concerted effort to like, hey, we're going to promote the books industry, the mm. Korean literature industry, and create this agency to help market, you know, Korean literature, you know, um, overseas. I, mm. So, so you do see that there's like a very governmental push behind it, similar to what you see with a lot of other soft power products like K-pop and K-drama and, and K- food. I don't know. Everything. Um, and yeah. Every, yeah, K everything. Yeah. yeah. So, um, yeah, I would I would say um yeah, in you would I I would say maybe like around early 2010s um you see this like concerted push for K literature. Mm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you like the term Beth K literature? Like <laughs> does it does it detract from the real seriousness of literature or is it like it it's cool, it's modern and that's the way the world is going? Do you have a a take on it? Um you know, so so for me personally as mm. someone who loves literature I think any news is good news, kind of like any any sort of like, you know, promotion yeah. or publicity is good promotion. Um, good. I, as long as I think um, it remains open and uh, democratic in that I say, like, I, I don't want there to be certain privileging of narratives, like a certain version of Korea, obviously. Mm. I mean, literature itself um, inherently defies any kind of censorship if it's pure and it's good mm. but um uh i do hope that k literature get however it's marketed um ha can maintain its you know um its true core uh which is you know the the purpose of literature is to speak truth right to reflect mm. and to communicate something about the human experience um and I hope that that's something that gets preserved. So I say I like it. I welcome the K-literature thing and the pushing of it. But I also hope that um, it doesn't get all slick and packaged in any way. Mm. I, what you said, Beth, really interests me. This idea that the purpose of literature is to speak truth. I, I kind of like this because I've often found that even though literature is often not true like it's fiction it's created mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. despite being fiction it often contains more truth about human nature human existence than like a real diary or a real event like there's more truth in the falsehood somehow do you have anything else to add on like the purpose of literature is to speak truth 
Yes. So Korea, as you know, is a very um, stratified society and maintaining face mm. is very important. I think you've, you've, after living here, you understand. Um, Because, you know, individuals are not really individuals. They're representatives of their families. I mean, Mm. this is changing a lot. You know, I'm not speaking, making broad strokes. But Mm. for the majority of modern and even ancient Koreans history, it's, you know, um, you're never really an individual. And you're always having to um, be aware of the social context and your position in it. Mm. And I think because of that... um, being able to speak truthfully and expressing yourself in your experiences in the context of Korean society as a Korean um, has been very restricted. And literature is like one of those few places where, um, you know, honestly, artists like, you know, writers, writers as artists can really express how they truly feel, the oppression, the, um, the pain, um, the trauma. Um, I mean, mental health is still kind of, like emerging as a conversation in Korea where people Mm. can openly say like, I'm depressed or I suffer from, you know, um, uh, condition, mental mental illness or ADHD or, you know, all of these things that are kind of passe in the West. We kind of think, oh, you know, like, yeah, Mm. that's that's not a big deal to talk about it. But here it still is because of the stigma around, um, you know, mental I would say, yeah, mental health is a big part of it, but also just, you know, generally talking about trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, so that's what I think that for for me, that's so in the context of Korea and Korean literature, truth is very powerful because it's basically being able to speak without any of the constraints, you know, Mm. of your social role. And, you know, basically being this like avatar, I would say, like in Korean, I I think of myself a lot as an avatar, you know, I have to maintain a certain like face, a certain um, image so that um, I'm protected. Yeah. This might be a weird question, but do you feel that there's a difference between Beth and Hong Eun Hee or something like that? I don't know. I'm just curious, but I've noticed that in Korea, you're right, there are social roles there's this thing like a boom boom um and as a professor i'm meant to dress and act a certain way and not do music and not wear tongkazi and these kind of things do you feel that as well like this the reality of this avatar this social role um so this gets to the heart of why i actually read and translate korean literature mm. um because I, as a, just to give context, I was born in Korea. I was born in Seoul, um, but I lived, uh, I left Korea when I was seven years old. So basically elementary school, first grade. And I grew up in the UK and Canada. And I spent the majority of my life outside of Korea. And I came back here eight years ago when I was 25. So yeah, it, it's, it, it's sort of, um, so basically if you look chronologically or just, I mean, cumulatively at the number of years I've spent overseas and in Korea, it's kind of reaching parity. So Mm. I've, you know, but because I spent the formative years, you know, of my life where, you know, you, where you come to identify yourself as some, something, you know, I I would say I'm, I'm Canadian in that respect. I, I, you know, I formed an identity and my, my values and my worldview outside of Korea. Mm. And so um, when I, when I encounter people, I think that they're very confused by me because I look very Korean. And even when I speak, I, I actually sound like a native speaker. Um, but it's only after a few minutes that they start to catch on that I'm not actually from here because I use, I start to stumble over certain words or I use mm-hmm. strange phrases that they, that a normal, like a real native Korean wouldn't use. And so, um, yeah, I think that literature has been a haven for me because it, it helps me feel um, like I'm not alone sometimes, like, because I, I do feel alienated here sometimes. And I do feel like, okay, like, what is this character that I'm playing? I don't know um, whether I'm doing it right. <laughs> like being a person, being mm. a person in Korean society. And so, yeah, like I'm always negotiating my identity and my avatar and my being Hong and E versus Beth Hong. Mm. Um, and how do I, um, present myself to Korean people in a way that's not offensive or, um, acceptable for them. Um, and I'm trying to understand that and negotiate that is where literature comes in for me. Yeah. It's very interesting. And 
I'm almost at about parity myself now. I've been in Korea as long as I've been in other countries, the United Kingdom and Australia. Um, and I think one of the questions that comes up is, should I be myself in Korea or should I just like go with the Korean flow? That's always a difficult mm. thing, right? Um, just Beth, coming back to this literature thing and, and you touched on things like mental health, existentialism, mm. identity, um, mm -hmm. like a, a sanctuary from the world outside. Do you think there are any particular characteristics or reoccurring tropes, themes in Korean literature? Is that what the literature is about? Because when I think of Russian literature, I have certain mm -hmm. ideas, these kind of Tolstoy and Dostoevsky, these existential and grand things, French literature. Are there reoccurring ideas in Korean literature or certain things that make it what it is? So again, I think Korean literature is so broad. Um, and mm. it really, it really does depend on which like subgenre rabbit hole you cl double click onto. But mm. um, for the kind of literature that I consume in particular, which is literary fiction, I would say mostly, I, mm. I and short stories um, in that vein. I would say a lot of the themes I see are class and privilege, actually, and um, you know, in class inequality in Korean society and the conflicts that come out of that. Um, and a lot of magical realism, uh, interestingly enough, like mm. there's a lot of surrealist um, themes in modern Korean literature that I read that um, I think has to do with the fact that Korea is such a, Korean society forces you to be very realistic mm. and mm. very concrete and very sensory. And I think literature, and, and I think as a result, a lot of modern Korean writers, they escape that, they, that one way to subvert and rebel against that is to really go lean really heavily into the surreal and like mm. the fantastic and to really um, investigate what lies outside of our five senses. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What, um, who are the voices do you think? So I, of course, Korean literature you've said is so broad and it depends where you go. You've got mm -hmm. literary fiction, magical realism. Who do you think are some of the most important or prominent voices in Korean literature uh, at the moment, perhaps? Um, so I, I feel like I can speak mo more maybe from a global perspective. Mm -hmm. um, if I were to be looking like as a, as a foreign reader um, at Korean literature um, and what is available in a translated language, I would mm. say, I mean, you can't really go anywhere without saying Han Gang. Mm. You know, she was the 2016 winner of the International Booker Prize, which, well, back then it was called the Man Booker Prize in, um, for the vegetarian. Mm. Yeah. And um, also, um, you know, Kyung Suk Shin. Um, and uh, actually recently there's been some international recognition of a lot of Korean authors. Um, there's, uh, I don't know if you've heard of, uh, Moms, Amma, but it's a, it's a graphic novel that okay, no. won, yeah, that recently won actually a, a pretty significant, um, graphic novel award, um, a Harvey award for best international book of the year, uh, back in 26, uh, 2021, sorry. Mm. And also, um, Yoon Kohun, the disaster tourist won the crime fiction in translation award, um, in, for the CWA daggers, which is basically the Crime Writers Association in the UK, which recognize excellence in crime writing. So that's, that's another major kind of recognition. Um, but I would say if, you, if you're someone who wants to know what's really up in Korean literature, um, I would try going to the LTI website mm -hmm. or the YouTube channel because they actually interview a lot of very prominent rising authors in translation hmm. and with subtitles. So I think that that is actually the best source. It's the most updated, it's very active. And also the um, Munhak Dongne, which is one of the longest publishing, longest running publishing houses in Korea. Mm -hmm. And they actually have their own awards. It's called the Munhak Dongne Award. And I would say it's sort of similar to um, any kind of like, emerging writer award that you find in the west so mm -hmm. um you know like the push cart prize in the u.s would be an equivalent of the moon hak Dongle award or um i'm sorry i can't think of any uk examples but um in in canada uh i would say like something like the giller prize that might mm -hmm. be kind of like an equivalent so 
yeah, that's um, so those are some of the authors off the top of my head. But yeah, again, if you're truly interested, I would really direct people to those resources. What is the LTI? That's like Literary Translation Institute or something. I don't know. I'm grabbing at an acronym. That's right. It is. It is the Literary Translation Institute of Korea. It's another um, it's actually another uh, nonprofit agency that I think um, what is really mostly funded by the Korean government and mm. they have increasingly in, like broadened their funding for research, sorry, translation grants. Mm. Um, and now I think something like the recent figure I heard was like 156 like applications to like translate independent, like, you know, in individual different works of Korean wow. liter literature. So you're just seeing it grow for sure. Mm, mm, yeah. mm, mm. Can can you say something perhaps, Beth, about Han Gang, like who she is or what her writing is? Because I think, yeah, she's one of the most prominent voices in the international scene as well. With like mm -hmm. Human Acts, The Vegetarian, the, the White Book and things like that. Who is she and what kind of writing does she do in, in, in your view? Okay, so um, I know that she was born in 1970. And actually, it's interesting that a lot of the writers who are getting recognition now are from that age. Like they're kind of born in the 70s. So I don't know if that's a theme, but um, just something that I noted. Mm -hmm. And... Um, yeah she uh she's she was born in Gwangju, and she is um someone who has been writing for a very long time actually she studied korean literature at yonsei and mm. she um i think she won her first prize in 1990 no sorry she wrote her first short story in 1993 but she won the yi sang literary prize in 2005 and Yi Sang, for people who don't know, Yi Sang is one of like the most famous Korean writers um, of modern literature. He is from the early 20, like he's from the early 20th century and mm. he's known for writing very um, esoteric um, literary pieces. And the Yi Sang Literary Prize is actually, it, 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 it's one of those big prize it's like the salmon rushdie prize or i don't know you know like imagine yeah, just like the yeah. most prominent person in your literary in your culture's literary scene and like having getting the prize like named after them and um she is very interesting in that she, i think she really did bring bring korean literature into the international spotlight when deborah smith uh, um you know translated her her work, uh, The Vegetarian. Mm. The Vegetarian is about a woman called Young Hae who decides to abstain from eating meat. And um, just of her, it's a very psychological novel and it's her journey into basically retreating from the society around her. Um, and she also wrote um, Human Acts, which is about the Gwangju uprising and the Korean government's very um, strong oppression of that mm. democratic movement in Korea, which is also very powerful and a little difficult for me to read, to be honest, because it was so um, graphic, but mm. also very important and interesting um, for readers who are interested in that, in that part of Korea's, that dark period of Korea's history. They're very different, aren't they? I, I've only read them both once, but the vegetarian, like you say, it, it's about, it's not about it, but it's like a woman becoming a plant and this psychological thing. And, and But then Human Acts is about, you know, Korean history and, mm -hmm. you know, the massacre of civilians and government suppression. They're very different, but it seems no matter what she writes, it resonates. So I think there's mm -hmm. something in her voice, isn't there? I, I, I don't know. She's very soft spoken. I've heard interviews with her and she's very sort of very soft spoken, but her work packs so much punch. Do, any idea why that is? Like why it works? Um, so I think it, it says a lot that a lot of the women, a lot of the writers that are gaining international attention now are women. Yeah. Um, and I think we can go into that a little bit later, but mm. yeah, she definitely, I think, um, just her being soft-spoken, but very outspoken on the page, like soft-spoken in person, but outspoken on the page is, mm. I think goes back to, 
um, like be just when you're a, an avatar, a certain avatar in Korean society, especially a woman, there are so many mm, like rest- I think expectations for the way you should act and be. Mm. Um, especially I think for someone of her generation, the 19, you know, born in 1970. And um, so, yeah, it's, it's like, but obviously we're all human and we all have deep feelings and, and, and we have joy, we have anger, we have sadness mm. um, that needs to come out right <laughs> in a health. In, and it's, it, and for writers, I think it comes out on the page. So mm. I think that's where you see the intensity and the, the volume like in in such a heightened uh level because it's really not expressed in everyday life or you know so not to speak for everyone but i that's how i see it it's totally a high context society here and there's this whether you believe nunchi is real or not there's lots of communication that goes unspoken in south korea Mm -hmm. it's not direct and so i guess yeah maybe the page is like that um i i definitely want to touch on like the success and the relation in in women with korean literature because you've written about that before we get there like let's have a philosophical question this morning so if we look at k dramas or k movies international Mm -hmm. and domestic korean they're watching the same thing but with subtitles but nevertheless it's the same visuals right and the same with k-pop you're listening to the same thing but with literature the book is actually translated, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, And so uh, what I'm trying to ask here, I think, Beth, is, is the vegetarian, the English book, the same as the Korean book? They have different titles. They have different words. It's it's a different voice almost, isn't it? Because it's a translator. So are they the same book? Are we we getting the same thing? Or is there 5% difference, 10, 50? So um, I'm going to be straight up and tell you that I actually did not read Chesik Juija in Korean. Okay. I read it in English, but mm. um, to speak on the relate, like on the relationship between the original Korean and the translated version, I actually mm. recently did an interview with Bora Chung, who is the author of Cursed Bunny, yep. a collection of 10 short stories. Um, and she talks about how she has a very close relationship with her translator, Anton Her. And um, she said one of her stories actually called The Head was written um, in some parts, some of the dialogue. So um, I don't want to give everything away, but mm. some of the dialogue was written in um, Joseon era ancient Korean. And she said how um, her translator, Anton, basically said, this is not going to translate well into English. Like readers are not going to, a literal translation of this, of the dialogue is not going to be under- intelligible to a uh, born an English speaking reader. So mm, she right. said in that case, they had a conversation about it and they agreed to just um, standardize the, the speech. And so I think, so to your question about, you know, when we're reading a translated piece of literature, are mm. we reading the real thing or is there something that's missing? Do we lose five, 10% of the original um, co- like content? I would say that's sup- that just from my experience as a translator and also from interviewing authors, I would say that it really is very, very heavily dependent on the, um, the social and cultural sensitivity of the translator. Mm-hmm. So their, mm-hmm. their credibility and their um, sincerity and their relationship with the author is quite important. And, um, Obviously. So in that case, you know, I can't speak for all, uh, you know, um, translated works, but mm. I would say that um, from what I can tell also, like the quality of the translation is really based on the quality of the relationship the r- translator has mm. with the author. Mm. Yeah. And that, and that translator's, you know, um, knowledge of the culture and the context that the author uh, wrote the piece. Anton Her is definitely a name that seems to be doing a lot of good work in translation and, and and those things. Do you think that, you know, you spoke a little about your own journey born in Korea, but then going abroad and then coming back that uh, translators of Korean literature need to have sort of, I'm not sure what the correct word here is, Beth, um, like 
cross-cultural sensitivity or they need to be aware of what they're translating from translating to so you said for example in uh, Bora Chung's Cursed Bunny with the the Joseon language the traditional stuff that it was like well this won't go across to international readers so the mm -hmm. translators they they sort of have to have a foot in both waters the Korean literature and the international one mm -hmm. yeah definitely I think that um I mean obviously I don't want to go into so, like a cultural essentialism and say mm, that sure. you know one must be racially or you know ethnically um the same but um I do think that whenever you're reading a translation it, it really you really have to um trust the translator and their experience and their intimate knowledge of the culture um and the, the context right mm, um so yeah. anton i know uh, i've actually also read um love in the big city which was the other korean novel that was uh, mm. nominated for the 2022 uh, booker prize and you know it's it, Love in the Big City is is a story of a gay man's life in the tw in his twenties and thirties, navigating like love relationships in Seoul, right? And Anton himself is actually a gay man, Korean man, and so this I I mean if you read the afterward, you know Anton talks about how this was personally significant for him, you know, mm. like this is a like a project of passion because it speaks his truth, it tells his story, and to me that actually. Um, deepened the the meaning of this work when I read it. I, I actually felt like it had um, a greater impact because I knew that the translator had a personal investment in mm. making this um, really the most accurate translation, um, not just like word for word, but the, mm. the 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 style, the flow, the 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 feeling of the work. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, that's very cool that you are reading still something personal. It's not just like a, a papa go or a you know an auto translate word for word. But there's some there's there still remains personal truth in there. And like you say, that's what you want. When you talked about loving the big city and it being up for prizes and awards and the success, it's really hard to go on Daum or Naver and not see stories about Korean dramas or movies or music. You know it's got a hundred million views on youtube now and things like this like views become news do you think korean literature's international success mm -hmm. gets the recognition that it deserves domestically like uh, does the korean media and society pay enough attention or is it like there should be more attention or it's just like well it's literature it always has this kind of less media friendly approach what's your take on that part beth um, I think that you see actually, um, more so than the literature, Korean webtoons mm. are, um, getting, it is a subgenre, I would say, and they are gaining a lot of popularity, not just overseas, but domestically. So, um, I don't know, I can't speak for literature. I think that just like in any country, you know, you're always going to have a certain portion of the population that's very interested in literary fiction, right? And actual, mm. like, literature for literature's sake. Um, I would say that I did recently read a report about, like, reading trends in Korea. And one of the top three are, you know, like, very nonfiction books. Like, you know, like, what kind of books are Korean people actually buying? They're buying books about investment, right? Mm. Or financial management. Those are the kind of books that you know, realistically, like out there in the real market, that's what Korean people are interested in. And then, you know, um, a little bit further down the list, you have like, you know, like literary fictions, th things like that, and novels. But um, yeah, I would say that, no, there's not really, the, there's not too much parallel between, you know, the kind of recognition that Korean literature and novels are getting overseas mm -hmm. and versus here. Like, I think Korean... I would say Korean people are a little bit more realistic in their realistic in their preferences mm. for books. Like, you know, they, they, like things that are more related to practical, um, you know, practical topics. But, sure. yeah. Is, I notice that, Beth, when I go to bookstores, if I go to Kyobo or things like that, the, the books that are pushed out at you and there's always books you have to find 
and books that are right there up in front that they always seem to be <clears throat> excuse me like i don't know whether it's a a chogok or a pakane autobiography political book or mm -hmm. but then there's lots of kind of investment books and self-help books i don't see these big kind of like literary things now i guess my question is is it like that in all countries or is is korea more the books are more realistic based here um i again like so this is this is i'm not an industry insider and sure. I, I i'm not you know gonna cite any stats for you but um again just like from my lived experience here mm. i do feel like there is a strong generally in society once you become an adult like you know someone who graduates yeah. university enters the workforce you know um things like literature and um like arts and culture are just their extras you know they're kind of things at the periphery but your main focus should be on like things like economic survival so mm. you know like stocks investing um you know getting a house um so it, it's a it's a very realistic or i mean dieting i think dieting books are also very popular and, mm. and everything too um like you know how to maintain your health basically um and yeah like non-fiction books like political economic trends um how to remain competitive you know in whatever skill set you want to develop right mm. and so yeah i would say that um yeah that that's basically where the focus is just based on my just you know experience of having lived here yeah no i i get that too and i you know it's not a good thing or a bad thing it, it's just something that i've noticed there is this focus on those books and i think even in music sometimes you know like with, with arts or with creativity not for every korean person of course but there is this element that you know some people will go to hagwon to study music not for joy not for creation but you know you just have to go and study piano and violin and these things um you've mentioned a couple of times beth webtoons are webtoons korean literature so this they're is... red i guess they're, they're just, to, just before you start they're definitely read a lot so right they're, they're right. almost omnipresent but are they korean literature hmm. yeah i think this is where we get a little bit into semantics and mm. you know what is literature and and you know what how how broad can that net be mm. um um i guess if you want to use a buzzword in, they're intellectual property literature webtoons like you know it, i their ips for short you know mm. like so i know that a lot of businesses are um they they categorize right like just anything that is original content that's mm. creative mm. as um as maybe not if, if not literature then intellectual property so i think that if you look at it from a broad economic perspective yeah technically they could be in the same category now um i personally don't think that webtoons are i think webtoons are um are a kind of uh how do you call it like a fusion genre or a genre that sort mm. of you know because you have elements of the visual mm. and um there's a stylistically there's a very big differences um and maybe yeah but i think in the in the fa in the sense that they are webtoons also do express a certain lived experience or truth or you know in someone's imagination imagination mm. yeah I, you could say it is um um yeah it, it is a, a form of creative expression and communication um, using uh the in in some part the written word mm. as a medium so do you read yeah, them I a tough question is it yeah good yeah so actually i'm a translator and i have translated um some webtoons about mental health actually called um summer breeze it's called mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and um actually the author of this webtoon has given a um sebashi talk sebashi is like the ted talk of korea mm. about mental health her her uh struggle with depression so i i personally do read web read webtoons that are um that have a social uh element to them like, as in like a social impact element so if mm. it's talking about mental health if it's talking about trauma it is interesting to me but 
yeah, full disclosure, I don't really, I'm not on web, Naver or Webtoon. You know, I don't have the app. I'm, I'm not really following on a weekly basis, like mm. the episodes that get uploaded on there. But again, you know, um, Amma, I actually read that, the Harvey Award winning, winning graphic novel. Mm. I read Amma because it's about a very realistic narrative about women, uh, middle-aged women's lives and their relationships with their mothers. And yeah, like... Um, Sobam actually, I really, I, re I recommend her webtoons because she talks about the many different situations that she faces in her life where she wants to express herself, but she can't, or she feels that, um, her just expressing her autonomy is somewhat, is not acceptable. Like it's not socially acceptable and mm. the, the sense of suffocation that she feels, mm. um, and yeah, I mean, I'm not sure if that she could have done it as effectively as a novel, you know, because like, it's just her way of expressing herself is visual. So, mm. yeah. yeah. Is, I'm going to have a look for this on my one. It sounds very interesting. Um, is, is Korean literature dark? I guess all literature and there is no one Korean literature, but uh, just listening to you, Beth, and, you know, sort of saying the, the, the expression and sort of the oppressive society gets people to release stuff on the page and so therefore it's psychological or it's dealing with these things it is you know sometimes when we think and i don't know if it's appropriate to compare them but if we think of k-pop or some k-dramas it's very sort of you know beautiful and aesthetic and kind of you know not always but sometimes very happy and is korean literature pretty dark do you think or that's just one aspect of it um Again, so speaking from the literature that I consume, mm. um, I would say that it is stylistic. The themes are heavier, you mm. know, so I'm not going to. That's, that's a good way. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Like I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, um, I think, pretend that there, you know, there's too much of the, like, I would say that um, I and just like my personality, I seek out novels that are more realistic. And even mm. in my consumption of K-dramas, like I, I watch things like Juvenile Justice or, mm. you know, like um, Strangers, like Pimile Soup, you know, like things that kind of get at the social issues in Korean society. Mm. Um, so, yeah, you know, like I said earlier, a lot of the themes in the in modern Korean literature are um, class and privilege and, you know, the, the disparities in society that come out of that. There's, um, uh, yeah, patriarchy and women's experiences are a lot of the themes that I see. Um, a lot of, um, it, actually, very imaginative science fiction and magical realism, you know, that because I think it comes from this desire to um, reimagine society and, mm. and, like, you know, that's very, that's radically different from the one that we do have, which is very um, stratified socially, and um, economically mm. and um you know even among gender so yeah um the, the long answer short yes <laughs> it is heavier mm. at least the one that i read yeah and maybe that's why people like it people want that stuff people want the reality and people want the the the, the deeper or realistic issues a lot of students beth ask me like for recommendations on korean literature or they say what what should i read and You've, you've gone through a lot, uh, you've gone through quite a few this morning, but what would you say as like a starting point? So imagine that it's like international students in my Hallyu classes or something like that, and they don't really have too much background, but you want to give them some suggestions to, to get into Korean literature as a jump off point. Where mm -hmm. might you point them, do you think? Um, so actually, I, I'm kind of shocked that not a lot of people know about this, but there is a website called G the Digital um, Korean Literature Institute Library, and you can actually get books for free. Like, so I just want to, I don't want to shock anyone, but yeah, yeah, yeah. this is us. like my, um, oh, you can't see. Oh my gosh. This is but, my actual, yeah. yeah. These are all the books that I bought from Kyobo. And I think I spent at least a thousand dollars there over the last few years. Um, these are all translations of Korean literature um, mm. that the LTI has has published. But these are all available now. Almost all of them are available online for free. You just have to sign up for an account. So um, yeah, if you search um, digital L LTI, uh, you I yeah I think that's the URL. Like you can actually. They can just browse and, you know, without having to pay on Amazon Kindle or going to the physical Kyobo bookstore, 
Mm -hmm. um, they can actually browse through all of the titles and download whatever looks good for them. And um, because again, I think for me, literature is a very personal experience. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, you know, what is powerful and speaks to me might not be the, exactly the same experience for another person. So, and I think it depends on whether your students are, um, are women, men, uh, younger, older, like what their, you know, personal lived experiences are like, you know, so um, also K-Book Trends um, actually has very, very good classification system. By genre, you can search like children's literature or women's literature, or science fiction, crime, thriller, mm -hmm. you know, young adult. So um, actually K-Book Trends is also a very good resource for people who like, yeah, see this giant category of Korean literature and they're not really sure where to start. We yeah. can start with the genre, you know, and your personal interest and start and go from there. Mm. Yeah, I recently read um, The Plotters, which I thought was quite good, but I wasn't sure how well it would go across like at a women's university for international students or things like that. Um, in terms of you mentioned like this k book trends and things like that just staying on literature a bit more we've seen some of them turned into dramas and movies like so the big one at the moment is pachinko i am desperately it's like do i have to sign up for apple tv to get that or what do i do um but have, have, there you go excellent well done um have there any have there been any movie or drama adaptations of K-literature, I guess more Kim ji young Park Shippin Yun saying as well, that have stood out, that didn't quite reach expectations. Do you have any comment on these adaptations to the screen? Um, so yeah, Kim ji young Born 1982, I think was a bit of a missed opportunity, the, the film adaptation. Um, the fact that they put Kong Yu as the husband. So sorry, this is a little off the cuff, but I thought... Yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> okay. Um, I, I thought it could have been a bit grittier. I could have, I, I think it could have been more um, uh, truer to the work, but um, I, I, I think it's in its nascent stages. I, I do hope to see um, more, I guess, um, like less of a, less of an attempt to put a shiny K sheen on everything, which is something that I think a lot of cultural products um, have. They have this sheen, this glossy veneer that, <laughs> you know, is yeah. um, very noticeable and um, maybe kind of distracts from the substantive content of, you know, what, what, what it could be but or what it should be, just in my opinion. Mm. Um, but yeah, Pachinko, I'm really looking forward to that. And I think that it's very... Um, yeah, I, I just have high expectations. I, I have actually in the process of getting an Apple TV membership <laughs> <laughs> just to watch this show. Yep. And um, yeah, and I think, yeah, I would say that so far I haven't really seen uh, like outstanding um, adaptation of like, you know, a, a piece of Korean literature um, done very well. Mm. Um, that being said, you know, um, like webtoons, sorry to go back to there, but like Hellbound, um, Itaewon Class, like there's a lot of actually um, very good adaptations on that mm. end, actually, mm. I, I think, and that are actually extremely popular too overseas and in, in Korea. So um, yeah, hopefully we'll see some uh, convergence of, you know, Korean literature and very like high quality Korean literature and high quality um, you know, film or entertainment adaptations. Mm. Uh, but I do want to say, I really apologize for like super, super, um, you know, intensely uh, literary listeners or viewers of this podcast. If there is something that I'm missing. Um, yeah, I, I don't want to say like, you know, all Korean literature, all adaptations. I'm pretty, I'm sure that there's a lot of great mm. stuff out there, but just in my limited knowledge, I really, I personally have not seen anything. Mm. No, this just gets the conversation started. And if there are some that listeners know, I'm sure they'll leave a nice comment and tell us rather than say, yeah, I don't get too many like Akpus or things like that here. We're, we're all right, I think. Beth. Um, let me just ask you, you mentioned Kim Ji Young born 1982. And mm -hmm. um, I asked this, I asked this respectfully. So I want, I, I genuinely want to hear your opinion on this. 
Um, I read that in English and I, I read about half of it in Korean. It takes me a lot longer to get through stuff mm -hmm. in Korean. Um, I, I, I thought it was such an important book um, in, in terms of socially. And, uh, and when it came out and, um, you know, the, the tragedy of the, the, the Gangnam murder and, and the rise of the Me Too thing, this, this book really uh, spoke to so many people. But as literature, I didn't think it was amazing. I thought it was this powerful social symbol that sort of united people. But as a piece of literature that I read and enjoyed and, you know, try to go through books, I, is it just because it was me or, you know, you need to be a woman to understand it? Do you have any comment on the literary content and the social impact of that book in your own opinion? Yeah. So what I thought was really interesting was I originally wanted to write uh, a review of Kim Ji Young born 1982, like an updated version, like, you know, in the six years since mm. the publication of this book, which is 2016, like what has changed in society. And um, through the, so um, obviously that didn't get published, but through the course of my researching Kim Ji Young born 1982, like the author herself and how she came to write this book, I was surprised to learn that she actually wrote it with a lot more there was a lot more drama there was a lot more violence there was it was a very like you know um i, I guess high-pitched kind of narrative but mm. she took it all out you know like for, for example like i think she intended like in the original like drafts of the book it was a very abusive situation mm. but as, as we see now like in the final cut we you know there there's no violence really right it, it's a, a lot of it is very internal mm. it's her reflecting on her childhood and all of the microaggressions and you know all of the you know things that she experiences as a woman mm. um and i yeah I, I thought that was very interesting and that was a conscious decision based on like from the author's um you know on the author's part because she wanted if she did intend it to be a like a social impact novel mm. um and and you can see that in her cite, citing a lot of the statistics and a lot of the facts. And um, yeah, it reads almost a little bit like a very clinical OECD report at times, you know, mm. like with a in a narrative format, you know. And um, I do have a lot of friends as well, like Korean women who um, appreciated the, the, the book's um, social impact, but didn't really feel that it was, yeah, like, uh, uh, something that really like touched them um, on a like emotional level because mm -hmm. it is it is some it is kind of very broad um, like every woman's story told through this particular woman mm -hmm. and yeah I, I agree with you I I also felt that um, if if you look at it strictly from a literary uh, like kind of stylistic standpoint um mm. it, it did feel a bit uh clinical to me is the word i would use um but what's interesting is that this novel it sparked such a huge conversation in korean yeah. society because yeah. it was so explicitly feminist like you know it was um i think before you had novels that um uh, well you've had feminist novels before but just not reaching this level of amplification mm. i think due in part to social media um due in part to um yeah just like young women's engagement with various platforms and being able to share right their experiences and using hashtags like you know mm. the me too movement and i think it just sort of all converged right it was a kind of a timing thing too because yeah. that's around that time was when we, all of these conversations were happening globally and reaching um I, I think particularly gen z women i think gen z korean women are very connected to these like conversations that are happening online the hashtags that are trending um on social media and um i think that there was actually a, a movement that was sparked by this a bihonjui like in korea we have mihon and pihon mm. right like mihon is like the term um, that's you that's been uh, commonly used when you want to declare your marital status me is kind of is saying like not yet married or mm -hmm. you know and and p hon is like it's more neutral it, it it takes out the not yet part it's just like i'm unmarried i'm not not yet married because mm. you know you think if you think about the the kind of subtle 
nuance be between those two terms, it, it is quite large because, you know, um, I think a lot of women at the time after this book came out started saying like, yeah, like, why is it, why is it, why is there an imperative to marry? Like, why is there some kind of this social pressure? Um, is there, like, why is it that I'm not a full woman if I'm not, you know, um, in, in a heterosexual marriage, mm. which is kind of one of those questions where, yeah, like literally this, this didn't really become a huge conversation in Korea until, you know, the, I would say like 2010s. Yeah. 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 It, definitely. The time is important before we get onto this um, element of feminism, which I want to address Beth, do you know why the 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 violence and the content was perhaps toned down in that was it for more was it just a stylistic decision was it to get broader appeal or was do you have any insight into that or any opinion on the kim ji young novel sorry yeah. Mm -hmm. um yeah like so so again based on my based on just what i i've read um mm. about this um you know i haven't spoken to jo namju the author like directly about it but um from what i can tell she she said in an interview like this was a conscious decision i made to not distract from the actual factual um phenomenon of you know wage gap and you know mm. women who um really do like lean back and step out of you know economic life and social life to um just basically play the role of a mother or a wife right mm. um being a good woman means like yeah not standing out not um like just just keeping silence and yeah she didn't want the like any kind of like dramatic violence or victim narrative to take over she wanted it to really everyone to focus on the the facts of what is really happening in korean society which mm -hmm. is yeah which is like women getting um harassed um getting like bullied um in in like very very minor ways but you know it adds up right yeah. so because she talks about how like you know her she didn't get enough uh she she always got food fed last like her and her sister and her brother was always given priority and you know um how it was like this unspoken atmosphere <laughs> of like you know oh once you get married you know, you should just like start backing out and, you know, like of, of, of your of your working life and your career and, you know, focus on your family because, you know, that's mm. that's kind of expect that was expected, I think, um, of her generation um, to like she was born in 1982. Right. So like kind of later millennial women to uh, sorry, early millennial women to, you know, kind of um, take care of their families. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think those. I can't speak, but from my own observations of being here, like the the realities of what some people experience. I remember I, I used to work in Gwangamun and I used to uh, teach this, work with this businesswoman and we would go down for cigarettes. This is like 15 years ago. And uh, we would go down for a cigarette and she said, she used to say to me, if anybody comes up, just pretend I'm Japanese. Because if they see me smoking on the street out here, I'm going to get in trouble and people would shout at her and things like this. Like, you know, even not being out of a cigarette in public, it sort of blew my mind that that was the reality some people were going through. Now, um, if we try to push this towards that topic, then, Beth, you've written about the importance of Korean women's voices across generations and feminism in Korean literature. I think it's fascinating that a lot of these Korean books that are winning international awards are, are written by women and also specifically addressing uh, women's issues. Now, having grown up in the United Kingdom, I, w I was used to seeing like a queen and Margaret Thatcher as prime minister. And so it, it was really natural for me to see powerful women and like women dominating. So I don't necessarily think I'm like a, a good person, but I'm shaped by the environment that I saw. But feminism in Korea seems like a really supercharged conversation at the moment. And what is feminism? What is Korean feminism? What is, what, what is happening around that conversation at the moment, Beth? Okay, so... Um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right, let's open this Pandora's box. Um, <laughs> uh, so coming from a Canadian background, I uh, my idea of feminism is, you know, social economic and political equality of the mm. sexes, 
you know, you know, keeping in mind intersectionality and how different social systems play, you know, different roles in um, and the variety and degree of oppression, depending on the categories you inhabit in your social context. Mm -hmm. So that that's my definition of feminism. Um, I, <laughs> I have to tell the story. I, mm. I came to Korea eight years ago. And I think in my first year, I went to like a language meetup and um, like a, at a cafe in Hongdae or something. And, you know, just with a big bright smile, I remember introducing myself being like, hello, I'm Beth, I'm from Canada. I'm mm. a feminist. And this Korean man in his like mid twenties just went so pale and he just started like he just got so visibly uncomfortable mm -hmm. and this was in 2015 and he started you know stuttering he's like so uh does that mean you hate men and i feel like sometimes like th that i never really forgot that conversation mm -hmm. and that interaction because there is a um <laughs> very complicated and problematic it, like i guess uh yeah peril like I, how do you say it like equal equalizing or you know like equivalent people make a make an equal sign between mm -hmm. feminism and misandry which is like ha man hating mm -hmm. and they're they're not i mean <laughs> i don't i know i don't need to explain this to you but mm -hmm. you know um i do feel like this is a some, something that i always have to explain um whenever i like i always have to have this like long disclaimer when i say oh when i say feminism i mean this not mm. this you know and um so uh so I, I i so for me feminism is um yeah e equal opportunities for all all genders so that that includes transgender right and whoever like i i don't i think that you know you're not bound by your biological gender at birth like if someone chooses to express themselves as a uh gender different from what they were assigned um, mm -hmm. then they should be afforded the respect and opportunities of that, you know, of, of, of their choice. Um, unfortunately, the reason I bring up transgender is because Korean, um, Korean feminism, uh, they're, they're, the kind of feminism in Korean media that gets a lot of uh, attention mm -hmm. and a lot of um, amplification, especially not just in media, but like from online communities, male men's rights communities mm -hmm. is um is turf feminism which is trans exclusionary radical feminism which mm -hmm. um which among many i mean i feel uh, uh like tenets that i don't personally agree with they 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 focus a lot on the biological female solidarity and mm -hmm. um also like lesbianism as a political choice not a personal choice so you know just basically like so to put it simply it's like keep out men at all costs no man is an ally mm -hmm. you know like you know all women are all biological women by the way like biological at birth biological women um are with us and anyone who is not is kind of against us and we need to you know like work to fight against them you know it's us versus them mm. and i think that is a very uh yeah it, it, it's a it's a point of real contention for me too and it, it it's upsetting to me that that's how feminism gets defined and and and, and um disseminated amongst mm -hmm. a lot of um groups because it, it's it's a very limited like it, it's a like it is a group right it is a legitimate um idea it like you know it's it's a community in 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 the feminism but i really don't think that it encapsulates or um really um for me it doesn't really represent the kind of social progress that mm -hmm. i want to see mm. so yeah it's it's very exclusionary and and i i think that that's something about Korean feminism that, um, yeah, that that's what makes it so contentious. Yeah. Mm. I've noticed, thank you for sharing that, Beth. Like, it, it's great to hear your perspectives on it, truly. Because um, I've noticed, like, whether, whatever it is, whether it's, say, something like democracy or Christianity or feminism, it becomes like a Korean version. It's not what you expect it to be from elsewhere. And the conversation here is, 
is different for lots of various reasons. What's is there a connection? Do you think, Beth, between uh, feminism, Korean feminism, and Korean literature? Because you, this is something that you've explored in your writing uh, and podcast and things like that. Does is it like that literature offers a better medium for women to express their voices? Did did Korean women find literature as a way of expressing themselves? Why is it there? Why is it not in? I don't generally associate K-pop and things like that with these movements. So, is that why is that connection there? Is there a connection there? Um, I think that literature is definitely not the only medium that um, it, you know, or the best. Um, I, I think literature is one of the mediums, and it's a very powerful one. But mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I think that um, the reason you see a lot, um, you know, a, lo a lot of women in that field and that sphere and gaining recognition. Mm -hmm. is um, just in general, like women, I think in Korea, in all aspects, all spheres, like, you know, in arts and culture, like whether it be, right, like in entertainment or in literature or in um, music, uh, women were just really um, put into a bit of a box and, and you know, um, a lot of constraints on what they were allowed to say and how they were allowed to come across, like how they're able to express their autonomy, their sexuality, their, um, uh, yeah, just their, their individual perspective. Mm. Um, because that was so constrained, I think that's why you see a lot of the prominence now, because there's a certain intensity to, like, you know, if you, like, oppression breeds intensity, right? <laughs> so, you know, when, mm. if you press something down for a certain amount of time, at some point when it comes out, it's going to be a little bit stronger than, you know, if it had just been able to freely circulate. So, mm. um, yeah, that's my take on it. I, I do think that it really, um, the, the, the repression is years of repression and like it being passed down from our mothers. Um, that is where a lot of the expression comes from, like the, the forcefulness of the expression and like the the sheer quantity, the quality, mm. and um, and it, it's great that it's getting recognized because it, it's obviously having it's it's having resonance, right? It's it's re people are connecting to it mm. because it's expressing something that they feel like other women or other oppressed groups. It, and it it gives people a voice, which is important because it's something I I think that a lot of my international students don't realize that sometimes. It's changing today, I think, but Korean women weren't even given a name. They were like given the name of their children. So you would call you would call them like Dong Dongyanoma or something. You know, it yeah. wouldn't even be the woman's name herself. It wouldn't she wouldn't be Jihe or something, but she would be the mother of mm -hmm. Donghyan or something like that. It's really amazing how deep that goes. Do you have any comment on this idea? You just mentioned passed down from mothers and so many of my students ask me these days about generational trauma and this passing down of things. And I, I, I must confess, I haven't read much of the, the, the literature about it, but it seems to be resonating with people these days. Um, mm -hmm. Do you have any, any comment on this idea of generational trauma or the woman's experience being passed down, Beth? Yeah. Um... I'm just going to speak really from my heart and from my own mm. personal lived experience. Yeah. Um, my mother was born in 1955 in Seoul. And um, she actually attended Iwa Women's University and she graduated um, in social work um, right in the mid 70s. So mm. I think this was actually before the women's studies faculty uh, was created there. So she basically came at the very tail end of like you know, sort of the remnants of when patriarchal culture was starting to go on. Well, when, you know, women's rights and uh, feminism, the conversation was starting to get just getting started. That's when my mom sort of like, you know, left university and entered, you know, society. Mm. And, um, you know, growing up, I'm going to be honest with you. My mother was a very angry person. And I think that a lot of the reason I read Korean literature and women's literature is because I want to understand my mother. You know, like I wanted to That's understand nice. like, where does, yeah, where does this, where does this anger come from? Mm. Right? Like what, what is it that made her so, um, yeah, filled with so much rage. And, you know, I, I try to, and I was trying to understand it from a compassionate and empathetic perspective, because mm. as I became an adult, you know, I've, 
found that I also, um, you know, generationally, when, I, when we say generation passed down, like, you know, when you grow up with um, anger in the household and anxiety, like that has a real effect on you as an adult, right? And, and you know, it, 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 um, there's, there's a cost to that. There's an economic cost. There's a social cost. Um, because, you know, um, I've had to, you know, um, invest my time and money into, you know, addressing those, those, you know, things that I grew up with. And so that's what I mean by the, you know, the real cost of that. And um, I, I think that, yeah, through literature, I have really started to understand the culture and the society and the context that my mother grew up in. Mm -hmm. And, um, and why she um yeah why she was so angry i mean if I, sometimes i read and i think yeah if i was a woman in this time i would have been angry too and i'm i would have uh, felt um a lot of rage at the opportunities that um uh were not you know that were passed over from me and on um, all of the um, times I had to bite my tongue and stay silent um, in order to be considered a good woman, an mm. acceptable woman. Um, so that's that's really, I think that's for me, per, just from my personal perspective, that's what generational trauma means to me. And that's why I, and that's what women's literature means to me personally. It's really uh, cool to hear that you can um, read or use literature as a tool to understand different generations feelings fears desires uh, just their lived experience at the time because it's otherwise it's something removed from us you know we're, we're always that and so yeah I, I reading literature to understand your mother is a cool thing do you ever get her to I, I don't know this might be too personal but you can pass if you want do you ever ask her to read modern stuff to try to understand your like 2022 experience does that work both ways um my mom because she grew up in a very like she basically like her context so she's she came of age when korea's like whole political and economic development was in full swing mm. she doesn't really read literature <laughs> that's yeah if i if i could be perfectly honest um mm. but um she interestingly watches a lot of YouTube videos and <laughs> she's very into, um, you know, what's going on in Korea. And she loves, I think um, in particular, sorry, this is very random, maybe mm. not interesting to anyone, but she really loves Yuna Kim, the figure skater. Okay. <laughs> and um, I think it's because like my mom likes like she, for her she sees this young woman this young figure skating woman who like literally went to the top and won the olympic medal as someone who really made it on her own with her own efforts and there was nothing stopping her and i think that um it, it's a bigger thing than just oh she's cool because she won the gold medal like it's really like i think um she's a bit of a symbol for um being able to reach the pinnacle without any restraints with just based on your sheer effort you know because you know kim like you know she practiced every day since she was like you know i don't know like before her teens so mm -hmm. yeah so I, I i i do think that um even though my mother and i don't have the same points of entry for making sense of our um making sense of the past and the social mm -hmm. context my mom does um really she's happier now. And I think that she's accepted that things have changed and, you know, it's the world is open mm. for, for young women. And she actually tells me all the time, you know, like don't depend on a man for anything, <laughs> you know? And because I think, and I think that's actually behind the, the, like the low birth rates and like the low rate, like rates of marriage. Like I think a lot of young women saw their mother suffering in loveless marriages you know mm. women of my generation you know mm. and they, they they you know and we're thinking to ourselves and i'm thinking to myself like okay so after seeing all that am i do i really want to go there do i want to repeat you know this mm. experience um i don't know that's just the sense that I, I get you know um along with the extremely prohibitive cost of raising a family in korea yeah 
yeah that Bihon thing is real and i i still really like beth this idea of uh reading uh to understand different generations and, and to bridge that that sort of generational trauma thing i think that's very cool um in in literature uh you described Park Won Su as the titan of feminist Korean literature, this equivalent to Margaret Atwood mm -hmm. can, uh, in one of your pieces. Can you tell us more about her? I, I love Margaret Atwood, Oryx and Craig and Handmaid's Tale, I, all those on my bookshelf. Tell us a bit more about her, please, Beth. Yeah, so um, Park Won Su is the first Korean Park woman writer. Mm. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Um, I've only so... got the English, sorry, that's why it's, it's hard, right? Yeah, Park Won Su. Yeah, yeah it, it's, it's, it's all good. Um, uh, she was the first Korean woman writer to have achieved widespread commercial and critical success. So basically, um, she like when I say Margaret Atwood, I mean like she was the first like female writer to reach like the same level of respect and like critical critical acclaim mm. and recognition in Korea, like not just by overseas, but like in Korea, mm. um, you know, by Korean society. Um, and that's why she's really seen as sort of like the matriarch of literature, Korean literature, other than, you know, Park kyung -ni, I would say. But um, anyways, going back to Park, um, she actually was um, born in the 1930s. Um, hold on, I think, yeah, 1931 um, in South Korea. And she actually entered Seoul National University. So her, she herself is very much a pioneer, I think, in not just as a writer, but, you know, mm. she was among the first cohort of women to enter, like, you know, higher education. But she dropped out because of the Korean War, which broke out, um, and, the, and her brother's uh, death. So she had to sort of, you know, be with her, uh, support her family. Um, but she actually wrote her first novel when she was 40, <laughs> which is also quite extraordinary yeah she wrote yeah she wrote it in 1970 and she won the Isang literary prize she won the korean literature award the Dongin literary award so basically all of the prestigious prizes you could win literary prizes she 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 got which is you know where also the parallel to margaret atwood comes in because mm. yeah she's um basically any literary prize you could think of in korea like prominently she's got she's won them and um i um, actually talked about her in the book review that I wrote from the the future of silence actually which I have here this is an excellent uh, <laughs> this is an excellent uh, collection by the way mm. um, but a lot of people broadly sort of categorize her writing into three big categories so first of all fallout from Korean the Korean War the hypocrisies of middle class Korean society after the industrialization mm. um, and also um, Koreans experience Korean women's experiences in a patriarchal society so um, I would say that those are the three broad things that she really themes that she really writes about in a very like um, real way com almost conversational so mm. she's been called yupjip ajumma or you know yupjip like sort of like you know your neighborhood you know, like wise, chatty women who tells mm. you the truth about life, you know, in this very relatable way. Um, and um, yeah, so, so that's basically a brief, I think, overview of her. Mm. I, I, that expression is quite nice, the Yopti Fajima, way of describing things and, and communicating ideas. Um, this might be a difficult question, Beth, but just when you were talking about Park Won So and uh, other writers and their education and things like this because you've also mentioned like class and social stratification i remember when i was reading inam he's making of the minjung and like the, the women's experience in in the factories and things like that in the 70s inam he described them as the oppressed of the oppressed like you know mm -hmm. they, they they were the bottom of the bottom because they were they were not only lower class but they were women in the lower class so w just i don't know if this is an appropriate or correct question but when you talk about the education it can't have been easy to go to university at that time what these writers these people were doing are they is there a class element in the feminist writing in korea that sort of does favor education middle upper class do you think mm. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, I think you can see that in feminist movements around the world, right? Like, um, a lot of the time, the first wave was really um, brought on by women in more privileged um, strata of society. So um, I would say that in Korea, um, 
to even have a room of your own, so to speak, <laughs> to mm -hmm. write, mm -hmm. you know, it requires a certain level of economic um, stability. And um, so I would say that a lot of the time, the women writers that I, I mean, based on my reading, like the women writers that um, like really got some recognition in the field, in the literary sphere, are women who were um, married. Yeah, married, they had some kind of economic stability in that sense that they didn't have to, uh, they weren't laborers, they weren't working class women. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they weren't textile workers, they weren't um, factory workers. And um, yeah, and, and, and now obviously it's changed a lot. You, in contemporary uh, Korean literature and women's literature, you see a very, very broad, diverse range of occupations and mm -hmm. experiences. But yeah, I would say that the generally the lived experiences of the women that I've read um, who gained recognition are women who basically did it as a, um, you know, as, as, as it started out as a, as a project, side project from, you know, after, their, after they um, had gotten married and started um, domestic lives. Mm -mm -mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that does make sense that they do start with sort of people with the stability and the freedom to explore those ideas, those post material concepts of equality, justice. Can you tell us, Beth, more about some of the writers in here? And I'm really scared to say that pronounce their names now because I've only got the English based on your article, but Kim Ti Won and Oh Jung Hee, um, you wrote about these. Can you go into some more of them, please, from that book? Yeah, so um, Oh Jung Hee is um, another writer who's um, of a similar generation of uh, as Park Wan So, and mm. so um, her writing, though, I would say, is stylistically very different. It's very, it's very intense, like very terse, like mm. terse meaning like kind of like Heart of Darkness. You know how Joseph Conrad has he maintains a certain tension throughout the entire book. Mm. You just never know what's going to happen next. And right. it's just such high tension. Like that's how I would describe Oh Jung Hee's work. She, she's a, she's a really master stylist at this um, sort of, yeah. She, and at describing um, this to like very um, dysfunctional situations for women mm. in a very like psychologically tense way. Um, and the story that I focus on in particular for my book review from Future of Silence is called Wayfarer, Sun Yeo-jae Nore, which is, mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, that's the Korean title. And, um, this was published in, uh, 1988, I believe. <laughs> Sorry, I'm like, I don't know why I, I'm struggling with my own, um, you know, uh, my own it's book totally review. totally all right. It happens all the time. <laughs> um... 1983, excuse me, mm. 1983. I'm thinking of Kim Ji Won. That's 1988. Um, and, and yeah, so um, Oh Jung Hee, um, actually, her first story, The Toy Shop Woman, um, actually involves a, a lesbian relationship between a, a teenage girl dealing with the loss of her mother and she starts a relationship. And so, yeah, like it's interesting that there's like a queer element to her work because. Um, I actually looked into her background and she really is similar to Park Wan-so. She was just like a homemaker. Mm. And so um, I thought that was interesting that, um, you know, right from the outset, you see this like connection to like um, sexuality and, you know, ex you know, she's this woman who's expressing like kind of a, a forbidden like experience right mm, mm. and like yeah i don't know if i read that wrong but i yeah I, it was a lesbian relationship and, and i remember being shocked because i was not expecting that at all right from from her um and uh oh jung he was actually extremely influential on the women writers that followed because uh wayfarer this this story in particular is 1983 story that i i talked about um actually revolves around the woman who is institutionalized and abandoned by her family and by mm -hmm. society. And she, um, you know, she, it, it's a day in her life after she gets released from the mental institution um, for a fatal act of self-defense. And she is getting ready to meet with her old college friends. And um, not to give everything away, but mm -hmm. you just get a real inside view into her her psyche and all of the thoughts that she has 
you know, how am I going to get back on my feet? How am I going to show my face to my friends? What am I going to do to make money? You know, and, um, but it's done just so well. And it's just done, it's done kind of like, just to make another actually comparison, mm. it sort of reads like Raskolnikov's like stream of consciousness in Crime and Punishment. Like mm. I, 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 you sort of feel like this sort of stream of very intense thoughts about like, okay, I'm going to have to go back out there. What do I do? How do I deal with this situation? And, um, you know, it, it, it's not, uh, it's not really political. Like it doesn't cite any statistics like, you know, Kim Ji-young born 1982, but you can, you, just from reading her stream of consciousness, you can, you can sense the social, mil like the context, the milieu that she was in, mm. because, you know, the things she says, like, oh, like, um, like, what are they going to say about like my, how I look because she gains a lot of weight also about, you know, from eating, like from taking like, uh, you know, anti, uh, psychotics, I think in the, in the mental institution. And, mm. um, you know, like, as in the fact that she talks, thinks about her body, she talks about her body. That's a, like a major thing that's still relevant for Korean women. Yeah. And then she also talks about, um, like, um, connecting with, someone who used to work with her when she made puppets because she actually before she got married this character in this wayfarer uh, mm. story she um really liked to make puppets for children's productions and um you know the irony is there too because she, at, at some point the main character takes out a princess puppet like the last one that she made mm. before she got married and it really reminded me of like how so many korean women get married with this fairy tale <laughs> um fantasy of like oh happily ever after okay i'm done you know like let's go with we're good you know like i, I you know and then you look at the divorce rate and you're just like okay <laughs> like yeah and and you see like uh yeah i don't know this is just anecdotal off the cuff but mm. yeah it's a lot of korean marriages do not end in a fairy tale and i think that this was a little bit of a subversive sort of like poke at that as well you know mm. it's like in it's interesting that it was a princess puppet and so, um, yeah, and, and the one thing I really liked about Oh Jung Hee's, this story in particular that she wrote, mm. um, you know, cause I can't speak for the, like her entire like work, but for this story, I really like that the main character is a, actually a very strong woman. She doesn't go insane. She actually is labeled insane and then mm. she gets out mm. and now she's thinking about how do I hustle? How do I get, you know, how do I get back into life? And I think that it was a really um, important character for me because um, sometimes when I read like even contemporary Korean women's literature, like like or literature from a woman's perspective, mm. um, there's a sense, there's a certain victimhood that permeates these narratives. Like, mm. um, for example, Kim Ji Young in in the novel, she is um, she slowly goes insane, right? She gets yeah. institutionalized. And, and, and Young Hae from The Vegetarian, mm. she literally turns into a plant, which is the most passive victim <laughs> that you can think of, you mm. know? And, and, um, and I said this in my uh, podcast, uh, but, you know, I'm not trying to attack the merit of the works, right? I mean, all right. the women characters have subjectivity in the novels because mm. we're in their minds, right? So we understand that they're not just passive victims, but in the, con in the social context that they live in, they are. They, mm. they are powerless and they do slowly get labeled insane and they, they they themselves also go in they lose their sanity and like they lose touch with reality and mm. um i really think it's important um to focus on also the characters in korean literature and fiction that don't passively accept and you know become institutionalized and um you know are like victims of of the of the society that they live in mm. so um yeah this was actually the main reason i chose this story even though it is like from 1983 and it's quite quite dated if you think about it but um for me it felt very powerful very fresh very poignant mm. and this is this is oh jung he's wayfarer this yes one, the, the... yes it's i i like that idea of you know you were talking about your mother for example earlier of like liking kim yon as, as someone that goes out there and crushes it on the world stage that you know really mm -hmm. uh takes takes it by the horns and does it and you know similar character in here perhaps um 
This would be a weird question, but I, I, I do want to ask it to you, Beth, and I, of course I ask it respectfully. Can men get the same value out of reading The Wayfarer or Oh Jong-hee? Does it... Will it be restricted in the value that it can convey? Because, of course, it, literature is not bound by gender and it can convey different mm -hmm. values to people. I totally get that. But will it speak to many people across gendered lines? Yes, I, I firmly believe so. Mm. Um, so I, I read broadly. I, I don't just read Korean women's literature. Um, right, right. Yeah, and um, I've read incredibly powerful novels that or even uh, non-fiction essays that have really helped me understand um, the lived experience of someone who's not the same race not from the same cultural socio-cultural um, context yeah i'm thinking of ten hazy coats um, between the world and me that's a um actually a uh as long like series of essays that he wrote uh, about his experience as a black man in america mm -hmm. and it's written as a um, as, a, as an open letter to his son, his young black son, who has to grow up in this very fractured and, I mean, quite frankly, ugly world, right, that, uh, that he's in. And, you know, for me, I'm a Korean woman. I, I mean, Korean Canadian women, I don't know anything about what it's like to be a black man in America. But I, you know, when I read Tanahisi Coates, I, I, I really sense the, the despair the the hope the joy you know like just all of the you know the the rain the spectrum of emotions um mm. that you know that and he's a human being and i feel that and so just like in that vein like i also believe that um these uh, works by korean women writers like if you come if you approach it with an open mind if the reader is there to really truly engage and understand mm. um and you come from it from the base point of like we are born, <laughs> we are born human, we die human, right? And, you know, this, this is just like a journey then of understanding and healing. I think certainly like, you know, anyone, not just men, you know, um, yeah. Korean men, uh, American, like any, any nationality, any race can connect with these works. Mm. Yeah. yeah. That was between the world and between the world and me, that one. You yes. Said? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. We're born human, we die human, unless we're young here from the vegetarian, then you go to a plant. Um, <laughs> Kim, again, it's in English, forgive me. Kim Chiwon, do you want? Ah, Kim Chiwon, Kim Chiwon, yeah. Can you, can you say something about her, Beth? I, I really enjoyed listening about Oh Jung Hee's work. Can you tell us something about Kim Chiwon, please? Yes, of course. And sorry, I went off on a, I went off on a bit of a tangent with Oh Jung Hee because no, I love her great. so much. Yeah. Um, Kim Chiwon is, um, so she actually passed away in 2013, but she's also from a similar um, generation as, as Oh Jung Hee and, and, and Park Won So, a little bit younger, I would say. But she actually, so the story that I talked about in my review was uh, called Al Madin, Al Madin. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, Al, it's the name of a wine, actually, a, a brand of white wine, from okay. what I know. Um, and it's, it's told from the perspective of a young Korean woman who, immigrated to New York to, to America and now lives in New York City and runs a wine shop uh, or a liquor shop um, with her husband, her mm. very emotionally distant Korean husband. Mm. And um, I found this story interesting to me because first of all, um, Kim ji herself immigrated to New York City um, in the mid 70s with her husband. And so there's a lot of autobi autobiographical elements that I see in this story. Mm. And um, also for me as a diaspora Korean, like, you know, it's always interesting to read um, fiction from the perspective of a Korean woman who, um, you know, is displaced from her home country. Mm. And um, for me, this, the, the, the most striking aspect of the story is its, co its commentary on um, Korean women's sexuality and their, or their lack of freedom to express their, you know, their desires and to express it in a healthy, well, what I think is a healthy way. Um, because the main character who's unnamed, the woman, she looks at all of the um, customers that come into the liquor shop and, you know, American couples who are on their honeymoons or whatever, and they just want to buy a bottle of wine or 
something, some spirits to to make their magical night on the town mm -hmm. even more lively. And she basically says, you know, these people are the chosen ones who were not you know, who, who, you know, didn't have to grow up in Korea because she compares her experience, her courtship in Korea with her husband where, you know, you know, you're, li you're liter like literally holding hands at the time was met, seen as kind of like, oh my God, you yeah. know, like yeah. that's some PDA, right? And um, she really, I think, mourns. <laughs> she's almost mourning her her um her life and her um the the constraints that she's had she has to deal with because um yeah her husband she she literally talks about how you know he's like a stranger to her and um the magic that she felt when they first got married has completely dissipated and i think this is a theme that still is relevant today mm -hmm. um you know, it's, it's someone also tangentially related to uh, Wayfarer because, you know, like in that story too, like the character marries with this idea of a fairy tale. Mm -hmm. But, you know, as we see, um, it does not end happily ever after. And same with this like narrator, you know, and it, it's actually harder for her because she's um, out of the social context in which, you know, it's even if her husband is emotionally distant. Well, I mean, if you're in Korea, everybody's like that. But here, you know, she sees such open expressions of, of, of ex you know, of um, affection and, and physicality and affection that she feels cut off, completely cut off from. Mm. And um, so that's why I really um, like this story, even though it was like written in 1988. You know, like it, it's so long. Like that's when I was born. You know, so I I, I felt like, um, you know, but something about this story just like really spoke to me because I think that it still has uh, relevance today. You know, um, I, I don't you you teach I know um, a lot of female students, but mm. you know I'm sure you you understand like that. Um, even today, Korean women I think um, are put in a bit of like a unspoken for Madonna kind of like expectation where like, oh, you know, if you're going to be a good girl or if you're going to be like, you know, a, like a virginal pure woman, there are some things that you can and can't do. Or, and if you break those rules, you know, those unspoken rules or explicitly spoken rules, you know, by your family members, mm. like you're, you're, you're a whore, you know, like, you know, and so it, there's very little, I think in between and like, um, and you can see that at play in this short story that I, you know, spoke about. Yeah. I wasn't expecting you to go. It, it's Freud, isn't it? The whole Madonna complex that that comes from. Maybe. Am I uh, I believe so. I'm just. Okay. Uh, okay. I've just heard it for so long. <laughs> well, maybe just. I just want to stay on it for one second because it, it, it's interesting that you're either one or the other, the, the, the whore or the Madonna. And they're both caricatures, they're both extremes, and they're, neither of them are an individual that's like kind of on a spectrum that, you know, does have some sexual desire and agency, but then also has some, you know, conservative or traditional, because that's how people are. We're not these archetypes, really, are we? We're, we're in between. So do you, do you have any other comment on this kind of this, this whole Madonna complex in relation to the Korean experience? Um, I think that as a Korean, as a visibly Korean woman in Korean society, mm. it's still very much at play. The, mm. the you know, it, it's, it's something that you cannot escape. Um, and all I can say is that it is changing. You know, Gen Z, Gen Alpha um, are really upending these very, very outdated patriarchal norms. But um, I feel like as long as even people my age, like t even millennial Koreans are extremely conservative. Um, in some respects and, mm. um, you know, have a lot of internalized racism and sexism and patriarchy. Um, so, yeah, I think that it's, it's, there's always going to be the tension there where, you know, you negotiate, you know, different social spaces as a woman and man, right? Because, mm. you know, let's not forget, there's also social constructs of masculinity in Korea as well and expectations that are just as oppressive. So, yeah, I think that. Yeah, I think it's going to be a conversation like five, ten years down the road as well. 
Yeah. I, I always, yeah, thank you. I always have to think when people say like Gen Z, Gen Alpha, Millennial, this is, it's so hard for me to catch up with all these terms and terms, what they mean, Beth. Um, you've, we've gone through some of these authors. Now, I, I kind of touched on this next question earlier, Beth, but in terms of international prizes, whether it's like Omaru Putake, the vegetarian, Kim Ji Young, they're getting international acclaim awards. You spoke about um, Bora Chung earlier. Is there significance that a lot of Korean literature and international awards and acclaim, these are being won by women and often, not always, but stories that revolve around the women's experience and what it, is there any significance in that? Um. I, I really don't know because I, I, I don't actually have any personal connection to people who are on the judging panels or the, the nomination committees of, of these prizes. Mm. But um, I, I do think that, again, it comes down to just the sheer volume and the quality of the work that is being produced, you know, mm. because it's not like it was always steady and it was always there. And, you know, just all of a sudden, a bunch of international nomination committees decide to stay, start paying attention. I think that um, as, as women of my generation, so millennial women um, came of age and Gen Z um, and started to really reflect on their experiences and uh, expressing it in not just in literature, but music and, you know, um, fine arts and so on. Like, I, I think that it is... Um, it just in my perspective, I think that it's getting attention because there, yeah, there is such an outpouring of it and, um, and, and of, of like a certain quality as well, because it's coming from a place of deep um, desire to connect and to express, mm. um, which maybe there, you know, our mothers were not afforded, you know, the opportunity was not afforded to them. So um, it, it, it kind of is, it's that, that, that energy is, you know, really pushed out into the world. And I, I feel like that is what's behind this um, international attention. Mm. Yeah. Do you think Hallyu helps? Do you, th I, I don't want to be cynical, but do you think people like on international boards are going, well, like Hallyu is really big now. If, if we mention sort of Korean stuff, we might get more attention or is that me being cynical and the work stands on its own grounds and its own quality? So, yeah, no, I, I think that it's not cynical at all. I think, as, as I mentioned earlier, like, you know, um, the government actually consciously, uh, you know, created a lot of grants and poured money into the publishing industry mm. as well, you know, to, and, and to help with the marketing of Korean literature overseas. So it's, it's not at all, I think, just a cynical, you know, thought experiment. It, it definitely, there's, there's real facts to back that up, that, mm. you know, Korean literature is definitely one of the... Um, Con like things in the arsenal of soft power contents that the government is pushing. That being said, um, you know, we're also a very globalized society. And I think that, you know, Korean, young Koreans themselves, like, you know, Koreans who are in their teens or 20s now are extremely wired, right? Like, so yeah. like, I think Korea has one of the highest usage rates of YouTube, like engagement with YouTube on the world, like, you know, in terms of personal vlogging channels, but also just like consumption. So yeah. um, uh, I, I think, when you have such high integration with global, you know, content and social media and the network and culture, there's bound to be an effect on the cultural output mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and um, engagement. So that that's how I see it. Yeah. Mm. You've been doing it yourself. So you've, you've done like the, the Korea Herald podcast and you've been writing these articles. So when you were talking about these, like, the work future of silence and how hard it was for women to raise their voices and how we've addressed how sometimes volatile the conversation can be around women's issues and feminism in Korea. Like Beth, you've gone out and done podcasts on this and written articles about this. What has been the response to this work? Was it met with support? Did you get lots of like, hey, did you feel good? Was there nothing like any any insight into that? What it's like to do this? So real talk, mm. I consciously decided not to talk about Kim Ji Young because I was a little bit scared about the backlash I would get. Mm. Okay. <laughs> um, yeah, what, they, back, they... what backlash would you get from you mean from men from other women or? men's yeah men's solidarity groups okay yeah mm. the um korean internet is a real jungle 
<laughs> yeah, I don't know if you've uh, had conversations about this, but um, and actually even women's groups, uh, Korean feminist groups can be very militant. And mm. I do sometimes uh, really think hard about what, what I say in the public sphere in print because, um, you know, uh, women, it's, it's unfortunate, but I, I do think that Korean feminism is a bit of a minefield. And if you set something off, um, you are very much a target of attack. Mm. And so um, in terms of the podcast and um, my, my, you know, my expression of my writing and my opinions on, on the internet, um, so far, I feel like I'm still at the starting point because um, I'm also learning. You know, mm -hmm. I, I'm also learning about, you know, um, the women, Korean women's experiences, not just from my generation, but from previous ones and how to how to be culturally sensitive um, as someone who is a diaspora Korean and who didn't really attend um, school here, like, you know, primary, secondary, mm. you know, post-secondary. Uh, actually, I did all of my education overseas. And so um, I really want to be sensitive about what if I bring any West centric lens or if I, I don't want to be um, unconsciously uh, judging a culture that, um, you know, I can lay some, like, I can claim a bit of, uh, you know, um, I guess, uh, membership to, but not fully. So mm. that's something I always need to be very transparent about. And the podcast is really a passion project of mine. And, you know, I, I've, I've said earlier that I really read books and I love literature and I read this part, especially Korean women's narratives to understand my mother and myself and to heal myself. Mm -hmm. um, and th the podcast on International Women's Day was uh, March 8th. And it, to be honest, the response was muted <laughs> because the very next day was the presidential election. <laughs> So, you know, um, so a lot of things and, uh, and also um, the war in Ukraine had yeah. just, yeah, just, you know, kind of broken out. So um, it, there, there's a lot of pressing things in the world right now, you know, like, you know, newsworthy things are always going to take the top, I mm. think, um, lion's share of the, of the clicks and people's attentions. But um, I do hope to uh, build a community of not just women. You know, and not just diaspora women like me, but mm. of anybody like people like you, David, like who uh, have genuine, sincere interest to understand the Korean women's experience and the society in general, you know, and, and um, really um, build some uh, broader net of empathy, understanding and a better world that comes as a result of that. Mm. Which often is it's a beautiful expression, Beth, I will say. And it, it, I think it comes from discussion sometimes. We, we sometimes lose that with internet. And you said the Korean internet is a jungle. I think the internet broadly sometimes is a jungle. And, you know, I, I can tell that you have a passion for reading. And I, I often wonder if we read more, whether we would be more compassionate people. You know, because to read, you have to set down time and you have to think and go into your thoughts. And it's not necessarily being driven by algorithms and things like mm -hmm. this. Do, does the world need to read more? But I know your answer, <laughs> I think, as an avid reader. Um, does the world need to read more? Yeah, I think the world could read more and the world could just... Um, I think that if every person who considers themselves a global citizen, which is actually everybody, well, yeah. If everybody, if every global citizen engaged with true expressions of um of ex of lived experience whether it be literature whether it be a video essay on youtube whether it be a podcast whether mm. it be um spoken word poetry film um theater music i think that if you came uh if you if you consume this kind of content with an open mind and with a true desire to um understand another human being's experience mm. and, 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 and find that actually there's, um, you know, you, you can recognize yourself. There's, you know, points of commonality. Um, right. And that, and, and there is where I think the true magic of, you know, um, of, of healing and connection and a better world can happen. Mm, mm, mm. Yeah. And I, with your podcast that you put out, you said the reception was muted just wait 
because it's there and like a year's time people will look for it and they'll find it and you know it's it's sometimes they're slow burners is my experience with these things beth i want to turn to translation but before we do is there anything that we've missed about feminism about korean literature or these things before we turn um, no, I think we've covered it all. I just want to say mm. that feminism is going to continue to be a very newsworthy, not maybe not in the best way, kind of um, topic in Korea, Korea, because we have a new president who has publicly stated that there is no structural gender discrimination in Korea. Yeah, speaking of the elections, mm. um, sorry <laughs> to, yeah. So um, I do kind of think that... Um, it, it's going to be a conversation we're going to just continue to have, you know, women's experiences. What does it mean to have an equal and fair society? Who decides those terms, you know? And I think literature can really play a big role in speaking truth to power mm -hmm. and not being, you know, caught up in the spin cycle of the politics here. Yeah. So, I don't know how much I'll go into this. Some of my students last week at uh, uh, um were vocal in their support of either changing the name or uh abolishment of the yosong gajokbu which mm. i thought was quite interesting like they were speaking up about it and other people spoke back about it and not i, I was trying to observe rather than you know direct the conversation but i think you're right and I, I think those conversations will continue and they do need to happen but hopefully with compassion and listening and, and mm. things like that it's so important um I was doing some posters for the Royal Asiatic Society Korea uh, for their thing and I, and I saw mirrorism and then I saw your name there. So you translated, I've only got this in English again from the Asiatic Society Korea, Gu Byungmo, Byungmo? Yeah, that's right. Gu okay. Byungmo, you got it. It's so hard <laughs> when you see that, like Romanized, I swear. Um, so you translated mirrorism. Yes. Can you Can you tell us about this? Like the the story or the process of translating it? Um, so yeah, I, I started translating for this, uh, for Nabilera, which is a contemporary um, Korean literature magazine online, mm. that's uh, all online. And um, I'm a volunteer, so it's uh, done out of my passion. Um, and uh, this was in 2019, I believe, in October 2019, that mm. um, this was published. And I, I it took me a, quite a long time because I myself would, rate my rate my korean skills as a very 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 high topic five or or low topic six and That's so good. yeah um but it, so i i think that this um work in particular was actually quite challenging for me because first of all um the the prose in korean the original korean um, was very stream of consciousness and there was no, there were no, uh, punctuation marks and, um, there was no, um, like indication of when the speaker changed. So I actually had to really go on, um, a lot of close reading and multiple checking. Um, and also there were some, uh, slang terms, um, and, uh, like idioms and proverbs that I think that really are not, um, I don't know, readily apparent to a non-native speaker, like a true, mm. like born and raised uh, native speaker of Korean. So yeah, it was, it was quite challenging for me. It took me about, I would say like almost five months to, from start to finish, mm. um, even though it's quite a short piece. And um, I really learned a lot. This was actually one of the first pieces that I translated. Um, and in that sense, it was the most challenging for me. And because Ku, Bung, Ku Pyeongmo herself is a, it's quite an accomplished writer, um, I did not actually have the opportunity to directly interact with her, even though I would have liked to, you know, but um, it was told from the perspective of a man who wakes up in the hospital and finds himself to be a victim of a, um, I guess, a bioterror incident in which mm -hmm. he he is turned slowly turns into a woman and um this is interesting because yeah this is a, a theme that i see actually in a lot of more modern korean literature as well for for women from writing women who write from the perspective of men who are um yeah like who who have to grapple with 
the reality of becoming a woman or like seeing things from a woman's perspective. Because mm. right now, actually, I am currently transiting Kim Mela's um, uh, another. Uh, it's called Intersex, and it's it's told from the perspective of a protagonist who is inter intersex um, and like born with male and female uh, like biological um, characteristics, and mm. so. Yeah, I, I think that this is maybe the new the, the next wave of Korean feminist or women's literature, like blurring the lines between like genders and really getting into, you know, the next level feminism, which is like, you know, gender is performance and, mm -hmm. and you know, the the social construct of it and really deconstructing that. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I think that, yeah, for me, um, yeah, mirrorism is like a nice like circle because it really was one of the first pieces that I translated and now I'm sort of back in a similar theme of translating um, this this work that I'm doing now and um, it is making me reflect on, you know, is this a theme that we can see in, you know, other future works as well, this um, questioning of the gender, yeah. When can we expect to read Intersex? Is, is, is it <laughs> like next year, th this week? Is there a deadline or? Um, so because this is a volunteer run magazine, uh, I think this is like a shifting deadline. But I do think that this is for either the summer or yeah, the summer edition of Navalera. So mm -hmm. you could expect to see it uh, sometime in the summer. <laughs> I'll have a look. Right. No, it, it sounds interesting. And I think you make a point that, yeah, now the conversation is going into those blurred lines like that or the construction mm -hmm. of identity and performance mm -hmm. and things like this. You mentioned something really interesting that I realize we haven't talked about, which is when reading Korean, Korean literature, not all of it, and it is changing now, but sometimes there's no punctuation, there's no speech marks, the pronouns are missing. Like it's, it's so different and it can be really hard. I, I spent some time translating like political, like Taeyong Ho's book and things, but just those absence of things that we're so used to seeing in English makes the whole process really weird, doesn't it? I say weird in a, I don't mean a negative sense, but I mean, do you have any observation on what it's like to read Korean in Korean without those markers sometimes, Beth? Yeah, it, it's very challenging. And, um, I honestly think I had some nightmares because of this translation, <laughs> this uh, uh, mirrorism. I mean, all respect to Gu Mo, but mm. I, I, I found that it was um, it was a tall order for me. Um, and I actually have also translated webtoons. I was a freelance translator, and I think that there's even very culturally specific things like you know chundema, like you know polite speech, honorific speech, mm. and terms like kyung or Nuna or Anni, right? Like, you know, Koreans who don't call each other by name, but they mm. call you by your um, social relationship. So, you know, if it's a woman who's older than you and you're a woman, like, you know, there's specific terms for all of that. And yeah. um, some of those things are, um, I just remember um, it, it's a certain, you know, webtoons or like comics that I translated, like they would either have like a box, you know, like, as like a footnote basically explaining what does hyung mean anni nuna mm. or you know like um uh yeah like you know saying oh this is a you know a title of honorific speech or to address someone and other times it was just literally translated as hyung you know what mm. i mean like they did there's no explanation it's just you know like or they just you know leave it out altogether so i think there's still those kind of like inconsistencies and sort of like negotiations based on and i think you're really relying on like who your audience is like you know if if, if your audience is like very very immersed in korean culture and you know they don't need that like you know footnote mm. like you know to explain what hyung or nuna or you know um honorific speech is all about then yeah that that's great but i think that for now like I I still don't see a lot of standardization like based on my experience and even you know so moving away from webtoons like as a uh, translator literary translator I still yeah I, I also always have those negotiations in my mind like how can this be um, conveyed uh, mm. effectively and um, truthfully um, in the way that the author would have liked to convey it and yeah.
is it always context based? So say, for example, you're doing intersex or you're doing mirrorism. It's not a webtoon with a little explanation box underneath, but you know, it's, it's prose or it's, it's writing. You come across the word, for example, on the, what do you do? Do you write someone's name? Do you just write on knee? Do you write like sister or what, what do you do Beth with that? Oh, yeah. Um, so yeah, this is, I think this is where, again, like your relationship with the author as a, if, if you're a translator, speaking from a translator's perspective, mm. like it, you know, your relationship with your author is very important because, you know, um, it is really a, a call. Like it, it's, you have to make a call about those things. And um, in terms of my personal uh, way of negotiating that, I, I think that I try to first look at the work as a whole and, mm. you know, and to see like, okay, what is the, the like thematically, tonally, like what is this work trying to um, achieve? And like, what is the, the, main um message or uh or the feeling that the author wants to convey and then try to uh and if it and if it's too clunky to have explanations or to you know to put in all of those little footnotes or um like if i you know whitewash it too much right like taking out all the you know titles and stuff then mm. and it, you know then then i I would try to keep it as preserve it as much as possible or you know but if it's obviously like something where it's not we're taking those things out or like modifying them or it's not going to have a significant impact in changing the overall message of the work then i think i can feel better to just you know take those out um this is yeah and i actually do notice though that uh, more and more in Korean literature, in translation, mm. a lot of the original Korean is being preserved, like Hyung and, you know, Nuna and, you know, like, and Amma, you know. Um, I'm actually thinking of Love in the Big City uh, by Park Sang-young, which was translated by on her. Like, I actually noticed that there was a lot of, like, the original sort of, like, mm, like, a lot of transliterations, like, I mean, uh, I don't know what you call it, but, you, you, you know, yeah. the words it, themselves are literally in the text. And mm it felt very natural to me and it would have been weird if I suddenly saw like big brother, you know, or like even yeah. like a footnote saying like, Oh, Hyung means this, you know, yeah. cause it just didn't feel necessary. Yeah. So, yeah. No, I agree with you. And as readers, we pick it up, whether you're reading like train spotting or you're reading some Salman Rushdie you mentioned earlier, you know, they will use different words that you don't have the cultural background of, but after a couple of pages, you've got it you know and it's that process of discovery i think which is quite nice in literature you mentioned one thing which was this idea of whitewashing um does that so perhaps i might ask you what does whitewashing mean and does it apply to korean literature and translation i think certainly anytime mm -hmm. you have um a work of literature that is translated into a different language, mm. um, you know, you're going to run into um, issues of uh, erasure um, or, or um, how can I say this, like, or muting of certain c cultural elements that um, mm. if, if the translator is not skilled, I mean, you know, basically if, if the translator lacks cultural sensitivity or awareness or knowledge. Mm. Um, yeah, there's always that risk there. Um, you know, I, I'm an amateur. I, I would call myself an amateur translator. Like I would not dare to even be in the same category as people like Anton mm. or Sora Kim Russell or, you know, all of the other Janet Hong, Bruce and Juchan Fulton. Like these are the real like um, professionals. But just for me, from my humble perspective as a as an amateur in this in this field, um, yeah, I definitely think that there's always that risk. And I think readers should always know, to, should always investigate um, the credibility of the translator and, mm. you know, not take everything as a given, like, you know. Um, yeah, it, it's, again, I say um, translation is not a lucrative, you know, it's not a lucrative thing. It's, it's really, I think, um, it, it, it's done out of, I think, a lot of the time, like a true desire to understand and to, to translate not just the literal meaning, but to mm. translate the culture and convey the culture 
um, to um, uh, to that od- t- target audience, you know, in that language. So, mm-hmm. um, yeah, you should re- as a reader, you should always be aware of that uh, of that fact, and you know, try to, yeah, be a- like just just you know, really be able to trust the translator. Yeah, I'd not considered these words before. The ideas of erasure and muting uh, they're interesting concepts for me to consider you mentioned that translation is not lucrative uh, and you mentioned some of the names there Sora Kim Russell went on her is it like a uh, is it a nice community do you all help each other or is it like because it's not lucrative you're fighting for the positions or I mean do you have any observation what <clears throat> the reason I ask Beth is because the the skill of translation excuse me <clears throat> the skill of translation has gone up when I used, if you watch old Korean movies or dramas, the subtitles, the translation is terrible. It's definitely increased. What's the literary translation community like now? Is it supportive? Is it competitive? Um, I would say it's quite small. Uh, first of all, <laughs> it's, it's, mm. you know, it's, it's not, um, it's certainly not a huge community. Um, I, as, as someone who does this as a, as you know, a volunteer basis and not a, as my full-time uh, main position, I can't really uh, speak to know too much about the uh, in-depth like goings on of the translation community. But from what I can tell, like I recently actually participated in a Zoom, uh, like open Zoom panel of trans- Korean literary translators mm. um, in which, um, I, everyone just seemed really open and friendly and collaborative. So uh, my personal experiences with the community have, have always been positive. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think you, you're, you have to be because the community is, it is so small and like, you know, you, you just don't know who could be, you know, like a good partner or connection. Right. So, mm-hmm. you know, by necessity, I think you should be, just a a decent, nice human being and, you know, try to work with people. So, yeah. Maybe if you're all reading books as well, maybe there's a connection there to being nice, decent human beings. (laughs) Um, But that's really good to hear that it is like that. Um, I think, Beth, coming towards like the closing part of this conversation, I I was going to ask you about like what comes next for you. And but I want to make the question more specific, which is, are you going to write a book? When's your book coming out? When does the book by Beth and He Hong hit the shelves? Oh my God. How did you, <laughs> how did you figure out that I secretly want to be a writer? Um, I, I, I'm working on um, the, my, my own voice and um, I, I'm, I'm actually quite happy that you picked up on my secret desire <laughs> to write. My nunchi is not bad. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I, I hope to, I hope to publish something in the next five years. <laughs> Sorry. That's a very, <laughs> very, very non-committal answer. Mm. But, um, I, I, I actually, um, in high school in Vancouver, I was really best friends with two, two girls and they've both gone on to write books actually. So I, I do feel this certain pressure from my peer group <laughs> um to to actually yeah publish something i really want to write either a collection of essays non-fiction essays um about my diaspora experience um and yeah also short short stories yeah what's what's the challenge in doing that is it time is it fear of going into yourself is it the the competitive nature of the peers is, is is there something do you think you're going to get this done do you foresee any major obstacles or i think it's it's really fear-based i think that writing first of all as i said uh literature is 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 about truth and um sometimes the most terrifying thing is to convey the completely unvarnished truth of your life experiences and your emotions on on for other people to to see and to um well yeah just consume and that takes an incredible amount of courage and you know you're you're basically burning you're setting your avatar on fire (laughs) your social avatar right Mm. because there are some things that we are we allow ourselves to say um and uh there are things we censor you know because we have something at stake 
right? We either have our reputation or even our, you know, our livelihood. And um, I think that though I enjoy a certain amount of privilege as a Korean um, who studied and lived abroad, um, you know, I still have to maintain um, a certain facade to, um, you know, be an economically viable, <laughs> you know, um, person living in the society, mm. you know, um, and that's something that any, like, not just me as a woman, right, and anyone um, has to negotiate those things, like, even you, right, I'm sure, as you said, like, you know, you, you can't, I'm sure you're you're you you bring dif you bring out different aspects of yourself and your identity mm. as a professor versus when you're you know um, in a different context like non-work related. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I think it's about overcoming those fears and to really um, get get to the heart of it and to trust that um, speaking my own truth is mm. is a uh, is a valuable pursuit and I shouldn't be scared of of um yeah i shouldn't be scared of the truth <laughs> right but but it is scary i agree with you and, and imposter syndrome is real and all those things it's it's i have great respect for people that um write books and do these things because it's 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 a big challenge i will say that i felt i feel like today i've spoken to beth rather than an avatar might not be a hundred percent zero percent but i i think i've got more beth than avatar today which is which is a good thing um before i ask you the last question uh, that i ask all my guests is there anything that we've missed beth is there anything that we, else we need to cover or add no i i think this has been such a wide-ranging conversation and i think i really want to say thank you for um your really thoughtful questions and engaging with with um these topics Thank you. I, I, I try. I do. It's not easy. And it's a labor of love, like your translations. You know, this is uh, this is all done just for to learn. Um, so then this last question, Beth, uh, which is the same question I've asked many people. We're all in this world together. What is the meaning of life? What can we do to to bring value to our existence, to other people's existence? what makes things rewarding what's the meaning of life beth uh, the meaning of life is remembering that when we were all born um before we were told anything about our identity like you're a man you're a woman boy girl you're you know this race this nationality we're human right we're part of a cosmic <laughs> tapestry and you know it's um it's, I think it's really, the purpose of life is to find your way back to that state and um, taking into consideration all of the experiences that have shaped you. So like, you know, not to um, dismiss the cultural conditioning and the social conditioning, because those things are, um, those things are helpful. They're like your markers, like, you know, you're climbing, you're scaling a wall and, you know, they're, mm. they, you know, they're kind of points for you to um, move forward. But um, knowing that, I don't know, for me personally, purpose, the purpose of life is to connect, yeah, to mm. connect with people, to um, make one person feel less alone, you know, through either through a conversation, through writing, through a podcast, whatever it is, um, in whatever way I can, through a kind act, word. Yeah. And that, that, that to me is the purpose. Yeah. I love this expression, cosmic tapestry, to reconnect to that. And I'll be I'll, I'll be a little bit honest with you. My inner psychedelic hippie would like look at my own ways of achieving uh, that reconnection with the cosmic tapestry. Um, what would how do we do that? Is it connection or do you do you have a, an idea of how people can better connect or re-understand this cosmic tapestry to which we all belong? Hmm. I think it's, it starts with your immediate, um, circuit, like the people around you, like who's in your life right now, who's in front of you, um, looking them in the eyes, um, saying something truthful, um, you know, really trying to have a open mind, um, and 
yeah, just being open to the world. Like, you know, if you're in pain, expressing that and, um, you know, not assume that the other person wants to get something from you or, you know, is trying to use you or it, that something is going to get used against you. Um, that's, that's how I try to live my life. And um, obviously I can't do that all the time because again, you know, <laughs> you can't sometimes bring your, bring your whole self to every situation, but mm. Um, yeah, I think, I think uh, if I were to give a concrete advice about how to do it, it's just to be aware, you know, to, to just be fully with the people who are around you, you know, really listen, you know, mm. instead of kind of waiting for the person to finish talking so that you can say whatever you want to say. Um, it's just something I struggle with. I'm not trying to come off as like a Buddha. I, <laughs> I really struggle with this myself. I mm. try always, I always try to have to check in with myself and slow down and really focus on the person in front of me and be compassionate and see them as they are and not how I want them to be. Mm. Yeah. This, um, this podcast has taught me that sometimes I learn more by listening than by speaking. Cause I spend my whole time speaking in lectures and things like that. So this is kind of a, a great chance for me to, to actually listen to people, not wait to talk. It's so important. It's actually a brilliant line from Pulp Fiction. Uma Thurman asked John Travolta, do you, do you, do you listen or do you wait to talk? I love that movie. Yeah. It's, it's great, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Beth, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>